Dr. Tom Henson, Dr. Dowdy, to Ms. Martin. Thank the principal and fail. It's certainly heartwarming to come to your own hometown and see such a large and enthusiastic crowd here in the interest of the great Democratic Party and in the interest and to welcome a uh, part of the first family of our land, namely our first lady uh, and her first daughter. <laughs> I would like to say in welcoming our first family and the other honored guests to the 6th District of North Carolina and to my hometown of Greensboro that they are in the educational cradle of this country. And for those of them who do not know that there are more colleges and universities located and situated in the 6th District of North Carolina than in any other congressional district in the United States of America. We, we are proud of that fact. We are proud of our past, and we look forward to the future with great promise and expectation. It is at this time that I would like to recognize the wife of the Chancellor of the University of North Carolina at Greensboro, Mrs. Otis Singletary. And, and the gentleman whom I introduce has the great honor and privilege of introducing the most charming, beloved First Lady of our land, the man to do that honored task is one who is well known in this community. He is the head, the chancellor of one of those great colleges and universities that I've talked about. He is one of the greatest educators in this state and in fact the nation. He's doing a magnificent job in leading the University of North Carolina at Greensboro on to an even greater uh, future than it has had in the past. And it is a pleasure at this time to introduce one of our outstanding citizens of this community, Dr. Otis Singletary. Thank you, Horace. Ms. Johnson. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, it is my very real pleasure to welcome each of you here today. It is a particular pleasure for me to welcome our guest of honor on this happy and indeed historic occasion. All of us here at the University of North Carolina in Greensboro appreciate very much, Mrs. Johnson, your decision to pause here for a short visit with us this morning. I want you to know that we have taken Linda's advice and I did indeed turn out classes. We greet, you, we greet you in Greensboro on a cool North Carolina morning, but we welcome you with a warm North Carolina audience. I promise you that. It is particularly appropriate, I think, that this particular person visit this particular campus. Ms. Johnson, some 72 years ago, this institution was founded by a man who had a particular vision, and his vision was that of the educated woman. Dr. McKeever, I think, had very high hopes for womankind, and I am certain that if he were here with us today, he would be especially pleased to have us enjoy this visit from one who has so admirably performed the varied functions of the modern woman. Wife, mother, homemaker, citizen, teacher, counselor, manager, patron, uh, custodian and transmitter of our cultural heritage, and indeed, of our social ideals. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my very warm privilege to introduce to you this gracious, unaffected, intelligent, and attractive person who has won, indeed, the respect and the affection of all of us, Mrs. Johnson. Friends, 
as I look around me, I keep on thinking of the lines from a song that goes something like this. Nothing could be finer than to be in Carolina in the morning. <laughs> it's a special pleasure to be on a campus because some of my closest relatives are students. <laughs> and I have it on the highest authority that the way to make a hit on the campus is to arrive during class hours and I thank Dr. Singletary. <laughs> I hope you got excused from your worst subject or at, or at least a test that you weren't quite ready for. This hardy old colonial state has through the decades and centuries sent many a son and daughter to other places near and far and wherever it has sent them they have brought with them the spirit of progress. I have learned that North Carolina's motto, rendered into English, and I won't try to uh, use the Latin because my school Latin's not that good, is to be rather than to seem. No motto could be more fitting, for North Carolina has not always seemed to have been in the van of the progressive New South but it has historically and unfailingly been in that vanguard. North Carolina has not only seemed to take the lead in providing to its boys and girls that indispensable way to a better common life, which is education, it has been that lead. The evidence of this is impressive beyond dispute. This was the first state in all the Union to open the doors of a state university to its people. Here in Greensboro, learning has been encouraged since 1767, when Dr. David Carwell established his log cabin classic school. And New Greensboro had the first tax-supported public school system in the state. And shortly before the turn of the 20th century, it had a larger proportion of its young people enrolled in school than any other southern city. It has not slackened its interest or its efforts. For today's Greenboro Colleges, the University of North Carolina at Greensboro, Greensboro College, <laughs> Agricultural and Technical College, yeah. Bennett, Lutheran and nearby Guilford and, <laughs> and you know when they called the roll uh, a while ago I decided I'm, I must not have known all of them all put together they have the largest enrollment in North Carolina and perhaps in the whole southeast this accent on education in Greensboro has given the world such men as O. Henry and William Wilbert Daniel Steele and one of our great modern journalists, Edward R. Murrow, learned his ABCs right here. The North Carolinians who have gone forth to take with them a deep understanding that education is a loan to be repaid by a gift of self. That is why they have been valuable citizens wherever they have gone. I'm sure that the young people in the schools and colleges here today are equally conscious of being a singled out generation, the one that is expected to build a society of the highest order. In this complex world, no college graduate can afford to consider a diploma a mere accolade for work accomplished. It must be regarded as a passport to the world and a license to be a practicing citizen in it. Southern men and women have never been ones to retreat from the complexities of the world. No less than, our, than 16 of our secretaries of state, from Thomas Jefferson to Dean Rusk of Georgia, have come from the South. The educated person is much more in demand today than ever before. Not only do we need technicians and scientists, we have an even greater need of philosophers and humanists who can teach us how to live with the wonders that science and technology has created. It is not enough to be able to create a giant electronic brain. Someone 
must think of ways to put it to work for the good of humanity. While we are designing the educational programs of the future, we must never forget that there are always different levels of learning. <coughs> Not everyone has the candle power to light the flood lamps of national and international purpose. But nearly everyone can strike his spark and light his little light, make his light in the world around him. And I want to tell you right now that it, it's with a great deal of pride that I remember that the first bill that my husband signed, the first major bill after he became your president, was a bill for assistance to higher education. And it was also a bill designed to broaden the vocational education program. I would remind all of you who are enjoying the privilege of good education that with knowledge comes power and with power comes responsibility for whatever community you choose to live in after your graduation. Last spring, I sat on the stage of the high school in Johnson City, where my husband graduated 40 years ago, with just six pupils in his class. Lyndon recalled how right after graduation, he went out to California because he was restless like a lot of young men are and he wanted to go forth and seek his fortune. But after two months, he returned because he discovered that right here in Johnson City is where it all begins. And so, for each of you, the world beckons. But I hope that you won't forget the communities right where you live. While the problems of Zanzibar are your inheritance and your challenge, there are the problems right next door to overcome, to work with. Edmund Burke said about 200 years ago, the only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is for good men to do nothing. So I say to you, step forward in every way you can to plan boldly, to speak, clearly to offer your leadership. Your country, our world needs you. I thank you for coming out to give me this wonderful, cheery, bright welcome.